Hello everybody and welcome to today's special episode of The Activist Lawyer. Well, I am joined by a very special guest in the studio today. It's Jack. Hi Jack. Hello everyone. <laughs> so Jack McClelland is yes. back. We'll not just call you Jack. <laughs> so listeners to our early episodes, earlier episodes of yep. The Activist Lawyer podcast will recall our very knowledgeable um, co-host, my co-host, yeah. who also worked with me as a paralegal in the immigration practice with Granite Legal Services. And Jack and his girlfriend, Megan, who also appeared on the Activist Lawyer yep, podcast that's correct. to talk about cryptocurrency. Crypt- I nearly said cyber. cyber. Well, cyber security oh. as well, yeah. So I nearly said up. cyber currency, though. That's not Oh, that. that's the next book. <laughs> <laughs> but the two of you popped off to Australia. Yep. And you went off to find yourself. What did you find? <laughs> that time what do you uh, not much just (laughs) being the stressful life of an adult paying rent and did you grow up over there i did i think so yeah slightly matured Mm. how so um i don't know just the daily stress of being an adult and buying groceries Mm. that's i I think i grew through that buying groceries yeah well we'll talk a little bit more about your experience but the purpose i guess of today's episode is well just to let people know that no sooner than we welcome jack back to the big smoke But you're off again. (laughs) Yeah. So we thought we'd grab him before he goes uh, to do a little episode addressing, I suppose, some of the podcast episodes that we've covered over the last few months. Yeah. And also some questions that we receive from our listeners. But where are you off to next? Southeast Asia. So we're going to Bali, Thailand, Philippines and Vietnam. Wow. And then coming back to the Big Smoke Nuri for, for Christmas. Okay, so you won't be aware of that. No. All right. No. <laughs> All right. So we have you on here for a reason, not just to listen to your lovely dulcet, neary tones that yeah. we all missed. Uh, but we are, as I said, going to chat about young people or not just young people. I wouldn't really put you in that category. Oh, I'm still, you? well, I'm now I'm the 25 to 27 age category when you're selecting right, right, things for right. applications. So. Oh, very good. I hate yeah. selecting things I know. for applications. It's <laughs> yeah. the worst yeah, yeah. thing to have to do. But anyway, newly qualified people or younger people who are contemplating a career in law. So really, we just want to hear your thoughts as well. And I know you and Megan and a few of your friends who um, studied law and are kind of in a bit of a tricky position sometimes. It's confusing to know what to do next. And I suppose that's one of the questions that we get asked a lot on the podcast uh, from listeners. I don't really know whether to practice or whether to take a year out or whether to go north or south if it's Ireland they're looking at. So we get a host of these questions and we're hoping to just have a general chat about that today. So what's your thoughts in terms of people who are feeling a little bit confused or even yourself? Because I know you've been kind of up and down and back and forward. Yeah, I'm still definitely confused now. I've graduated from a master's a good few years now and I'm still not really knowing where where to be at or what what to do. Myself, I'm surrounded by lots of people who have done law now and have gone down completely different paths. So I've got people who have done law and are now doing a PhD in, in Queens. I know right. two people who are doing PhDs are two or two or three years into that. Mm-hmm. And then I've got people who are currently about to qualify as solicitors. People who I studied with are fully qualified solicitors now working in Belfast and London. And then I've got people like myself, like Megan, who just completed master's and had fully set on becoming lawyers and then pulled the plug last minute. So I, I was mm-hmm. I was doing the um, training and being taught for the exam to, be, to join yeah. the institute in Northern Ireland. Delphi, yeah. yeah, and I was I had completed half the, the classes before the exam and then decided, actually, mm-hmm. I'm not going to set the exam, had to contact them pull out and just decided to then to go to go traveling before i finished my masters and the reason why i got into my masters to qualify was to qualify as a a solicitor and i think through my studies you know the talk the talk about career paths in in some modules but really it was it was all about becoming a barrister or a solicitor and there was no further discussion about any other particular yeah. roots roots in law so i know actually speaking about this now megan was up in queens about two two or three weeks ago now speaking to young people who are just doing their a levels mm-hmm. and she was brought in to talk about different paths in law so they actually brought in a range of different people who Brilliant. from barristers judges lawyers 
you know, and other people who done law but and, and went in, into other career paths other than practicing. So I think that's very good because, you know, if you're sitting there and being told, you know, be a solicitor or be a barrister, you've no other knowledge of what else yeah. you can do. And then that leaves you to have to go and research it yourself mm-hmm. and, and that's quite difficult. So yeah, that's what we we decided to pack pack it in, not not qualify straight away and go across to Australia. Uh, no, with no intention of working in law while we were over there. But you did end but up working had, in law. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Tell so, us a bit about that. So we both actually ended up working as legal compliance officers hmm. for an online technology company and gambling company. Um, and it, it was like it was great. It was great work because we got to use the skills that we developed by doing law. We got to use them in the job, but without actually practicing. So it was more in house. Uh, working with you know policies that that are all over the globe. So the company that we worked for worked in basically every country mm-hmm. uh, around the world. Yeah. So we had to constantly review regulations and policies from different countries mm-hmm. and make sure that the the company was compliant with all of those those laws and mm-hmm. uh, any complaints that came in, we we had to deal with them and. and reference the complaint with with what we were doing and to make sure that you know we were still compliant mm. compliant with the regulations and, and keeping update up to date so god you really did grow up when you went over for to australia didn't i you? think Probably so yeah very sensibly yeah, about yeah, compliance yeah. and regulations yeah and all yeah hmm. well i've got my professional hat on now so okay um, but no it was great it was, yeah it, was it great sounds like great experience yeah. and you did come back a little bit smarter i might yeah. add well, thank you <laughs> <laughs> Take that. Very when i met you you were very interested in working in equality yeah and discrimination and those types of areas in general yeah. i think um are you still interested in pursuing that or have you changed your mind no i, de- I definitely am still interested in that i think i do i do think whatever my career ends up being i don't know if i'll practice but i do think that it'll be mm-hmm. in in human rights yeah um in some sort of social justice area and mm-hmm. um, whether that's practicing or whether that's you know yeah. so advisory you roles and, and yeah. stuff like that so Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like um, that's where I'm going to end up. Still don't know where it'll be, but yeah, that's where it'll the end up. The world is your oyster, yep. as they say, Jack. Yep. It really applies to you. Yep. But I think it's refreshing, and that's why I'm happy to have you on to talk about this, because there is still that, well, am I going to be a barrister or a solicitor is the main kind of question that yep. a lot of people ask. But you're really looking at, well, whether you need to qualify at all. And in some cases, it is advantageous, depending mm-hmm. on what route you want to go down. Having a master's seems to be very important, I find, for applying for international yep. positions, it seems to be. Yep. Um, languages are also important. Yes. So you might think about if you wanted to work internationally, you may need one of the languages of the UN mm-hmm. or the EU, um, depending on the type of job. So there's lots of considerations for law, law students who are um, contemplating um, a career and then of course once you do start working if you do take up uh, practice as a solicitor and start to train as a solicitor or barrister, it's sometimes hard to get out of it oh yeah well, that's, <laughs> because yeah. you've invested so much it yeah. costs a lot and um, in many instances it takes a lot of time there's yeah. a huge amount of work that goes into it and very often people you know stay at it because of that you know yeah. uh, very often people stay at it because they absolutely love it as well and they're yeah. very passionate about their job but I think there is a lot to think about and it's good that people are taking time to do that. And if you can take a year out like you did and, yeah. you know, get some experience elsewhere, I think it's really, really worthwhile doing it because it is something that we're coming up um, against all the time. And also people who are exploring maybe two careers at the same time. Yeah. Somebody contacted us about whether they're really interested in data and this cyber uh, security and all of that. But yeah. they also wanted to do immigration and human rights. Yeah. So they were trying to figure out how they might you know, forge a career in, in the two areas. So yeah. people are kind of more open and more broad when it comes to contemplating what they're going to do in law. Whereas yeah. I think when I did it, it was you picked solicitor or barrister solicitor and then you chose your specialist area and that was yeah. it and i think a lot of people are actually going down the path of having two careers completely separate to each other mm-hmm. like i know lots of people who are working in a professional if you'd like to call it that job and say law mm-hmm. but on the side they're doing something completely completely different yeah. whether it's it or social media or Bacon, on the side. You know, Are these like side hustles? So, well, the side hustles, but then they turn into careers. full on, mm-hmm. full on careers. You know, so yeah. And you also see people, which I'm coming across a lot, and we have had so many guests on the Activist Lawyer podcast who work primarily in corporate, yeah. 
But outside of that, they're wholly committed to working in human rights yeah. where they might volunteer with an organization or they bring their skills mm-hmm. um, their unique skill set as corporate lawyers to um, an NGO where they volunteer, provide legal advice. So it's really, you know, a lot more free and a lot more open, yeah. I think, which is good. So just thinking about our um, podcast. Did you listen to the podcast? I have. Yeah. Have you? I have. Yeah. I'm going to grill you. Yeah. Okay? Not every not every podcast. <laughs> now you have done so many. You're nearly up to 100. So I am going to grill you. I'm only joking. Yeah. One thing we'll focus on today is really the piece around advice. And most of our guests, not all of them, but most of them are asked the same question around, well, what type of advice would you give to somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps? Mm-hmm. So I thought we'd talk about some of our recent guests. We obviously can't go into all of them, but some that kind of are fresh in my memory yep. that stuck out to me. And maybe we could just have a chat about that. Our latest episode was Daniel Macover. Yep. So Daniel is uh, just, I was just so delighted to have him yeah. on as a guest and um, he is somebody who really works in challenging areas of law. I mean he's an expert in inquests and um, he's a leading human rights lawyer and works in criminal justice and holding the state to account on very many actions that he's taken over the years. Uh, but he really focused on when we were asking him about uh, you know people who'd like to pursue his line of work. He really focused on networking and getting to know the area of work that you want to focus on by Mm -hmm. linking in with organisations that do, for example, as he mentioned, strategic litigation, which is a really good example. He mentioned the organisation Inquest, uh, but he also reassured anybody contemplating a career like this um, as a solicitor, which is what he is, that they will be part of a really vibrant and kind of thoughtful and passionate community, which is true. Yep. There's always support out there. And he commented on how his firm, and I thought this was really important, his firm and presumably others are doing far better in terms of support for their lawyers, acknowledging how difficult and challenging this work can be. I mean, you worked with me in immigration yep. a little bit, and for years I've worked in human rights and immigration. There w- wasn't really support out there when no, I did it. No. You basically had to listen to absolutely traumatizing cases, take statements. And of course, it's the client comes first, and their story is central, and you're obviously representing them. But it does you know wear on you a little bit it has to Uh, but there wasn't really a whole lot out there back then so I thought this was really good in terms of um, learning that if you do want to contemplate a career in human rights acknowledge that the area is challenging it will be Mm -hmm. very very difficult and it's not nine to five no Um, you know we often talk about this work-life balance it really doesn't exist as such no, but I, I, in the yeah. way that we might want it to for people who maybe see this more as a vocation as yep. opposed to a career but it's refreshing to know that there's support out there it's yeah. crucial actually yeah i feel like when you're when you dedicate your life to something it might not be nine to five but because you're so passionate about it you don't mind going above and beyond yeah. the hours that are set in, in in a contract you know so and i feel like everyone because everyone is so um, dedicated to a specific cause, whatever it is, everyone is there to support each other because yeah. they know this person. Obviously, you're like a sponge, say mm-hmm. you're dealing with a client, you're like a sponge, you're taking on some of that trauma. Of course, yeah. um, and if everyone is, is in the same place, you know, you're there to support yeah. somebody else if if they're finding exactly. it difficult. So. It's really good to hear that. And also a really interesting episode was Frank McGuinness, who that his episode really stands out for me. It was so unique. He came from the perspective of somebody who maintains and holds really strong political views. And maybe people like him, and at least he himself, maybe felt that a career in law was quite going to be quite isolating. Mm-hmm. And it might have been almost like a conflict in terms of what his political beliefs are. So he goes through the kind of pluses and negatives about it. But really his advice is you know, about people being themselves and being their true authentic self and using the law to make that change. So one of his pieces of advice for anybody, and I suppose with Frank's background, it was in relation to, you know, talking about anti-capitalist organisations as well, maybe joining those if um, that's where your politics are aligned, but not being afraid to get into the profession and seeing it as a barrier, but representing your clients under whatever political beliefs that you hold and making sure that you use the law that 
helps them. Yeah. And very often it, there will be conflicts. He mentions that even if the, the state makes you know a change in law that's an absolute conflict with your beliefs and what your client believes in, mm-hmm. well, you still have to work through that and yeah. represent them as best you can. And I thought he was so refreshing. Another thing was he um, gave a list of books to read as well that were okay. really helpful yeah. and spoke about um, different speakers at panels that he attended that gave him a little bit more kind of confidence, I suppose, to battle through the negative yeah. comments because he is very focused on his own objectives and his aims. He's very much a very pro-Palestinian activist, very strong in that, and he wants to use that within his profession and make sure that he um, works towards his aims. So I thought that was just a really candid and open interview and really interesting for people who maybe have a conflict and think the legal profession might be really off-putting for them, despite the fact that they might want to get into it. I don't know if you listen to Wendy Joseph, who's the judge, Um, she did say there's no such thing as a career route or a journey to becoming a judge but she does give some tips and points about how to get a pupillage and how you can work your way through it and she had a fascinating journey as well as somebody who started out when there was very little women in the profession and you know she really has um, gone from strength to strength with her career and of course has um, written two or three two, two books anyway that I've read about her journey and her experience as well yeah, well, actually, thinking about using the law as a tool, one of my favourite episodes was Care and mm-hmm. um, from Phoenix Law yeah. in Belfast. He's brilliant. Um, I was actually listening to that while while I was still in Australia, and one of the things that stood out to me, and it really hit home with me, because before I got into law, I was hemming and hawing about getting into politics, mm-hmm. um, just... Uh, I'd say a lot of people go through this about making a change in your local community and how and how you can do that, especially about uh, specific topics or areas that you're passionate about and how you, you would make a change in your local community. Um, but then looking at the, the la- legal and political landscape in Northern Ireland, I just thought that there was no point getting into politics because once you get in, really, you're, I felt like I was never going to make an impact. A, an, an impact. And... Uh, Kieran was actually talking about how, again, due to the political landscape in Northern Ireland, really the Northern Ireland Northern Ireland executive, mm-hmm. you know, they're not because of the way it's set up, they aren't in a position to make change uh, in Northern Ireland. So he talked about how he used the law as a way to to make a change. That, yeah. yeah, and the, he did talk about the battle about how lawyers shouldn't be involved in political change. Only when it it has to has to be used, and he talked about you know same sex marriage and yeah. abortion in Northern Ireland. How he felt like he had to use his background to make a change in Northern Ireland, and I think that that was a big thing for me. It was, yeah, and it, he also comments on how brave I suppose clients are. They shouldn't need yeah. to take this type of litigation or be involved in it, but they're very courageous. Yeah, you know yeah. that it all kind of falls on their shoulders, and yeah. of course his is part of the legal team to make that change and. Him and I mean, I'm sure his team behind him as well have made significant change yep. in Northern Ireland yeah. through strategic through his litigation, and it's been absolutely fascinating to speak to him. Just staying on Kieran's episode as well, one of the uh, pieces of advice that he gives, which is excellent, he goes straight to studying, yep. and it's really for students who are doing law. And he says that when you're studying, pick topics that you're interested in, but link with projects that can help you. Mm -hmm. So he refers to his dissertation and he linked to the Rainbow Project in Northern Ireland. And what they got was, well, he got help from them. Obviously, it was a hands on experience, but they also got somebody that came on board and and was able to help with them and somebody very interested in the work that they were doing. So both both the organization and the student benefit. And his point is that law shouldn't be academic only. Obviously, it is to some extent. But he talks about trying to get as much practical and hands on experience as you can so that when you start work, and I think this is really important, you bring more experience in terms of advocacy and writing skills. And he mentions that this is important because times are tough, as we know, for practices, especially high street practices that cover Mm -hmm. so many areas of law. It's beneficial for them to take someone on who has that little bit of extra experience. Yeah. He's not just fresh out of college and only has their books and their brilliant academic scores to rely on, but um, has this kind of, you know, added, brings an added value to yeah. the firm. So I really think that was excellent advice that I never really, I, I never really thought of before. Yeah, I, I think there's a big difference between reading the law and using the law. 
Mm-hmm. Um, like I, from my experience, both with you working on immigration, uh, working on compliance in Australia, I feel like over those four years, mm-hmm. I learned way more yeah. than, than I did in university in terms of academics because, you know, you can, you can read the book and you can, you can write, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a 2000 word essay on something, but you forget that very quick. But when you're, when you're talking to people in real life and, and working, that stands by yes. and you're constantly, constantly remembering that. Yeah. So I think it, you're right. Yeah. yeah. And then just staying on the kind of Northern Ireland theme, an Irish theme, I suppose, and it applies to the UK as well. Una Boyd was on from Cash, who we know, Jack, mm-hmm. through yes. our immigration work. Um, but she said that there was still a strong focus on key practice areas in law that excluded human rights. And she does go into that in a little bit of detail, which I think it's really important, where she says that um, people and even recruiters can be a bit dismissive around people who want to get experience in human rights work or pursue human rights law as a career. So she says to really think about it and show, you know, look at what it can offer you. Um, And again, she's an example of somebody who did practice, but now works in house in a fantastic NGO where she's making huge change, significant change on this this island. So um, I think that's an important episode too from a practical perspective and yeah. also making sure, giving people a little bit of confidence, um, you know, to really pursue it if that's what they want to do and find out more about it. Uh, another person, I don't know if you got to listen to Leslie Thomas, KC. We had an extended episode because Leslie um, will also feature as our activist lawyer, one of our authors for our activist wow. lawyer book club. But Leslie is one of our guests, like others, who, you know, entered into law because of personal experience. Yeah. And as a young black teenager growing up in London, he experienced horrific injustice at the hand of at hands of the police, and he ended up then representing people who experienced that and more mm-hmm. um, at the hands of the state in his amazing, fascinating career in inquests and uh, criminal justice work as well. And he goes into great detail about his experience in law in, in the courtroom as well and yeah. the racism that he experienced um, there within um, the institution itself so but he says again that the career I mean nobody does it for the money which no. is what a lot of our guests point out yeah. they do it because it's rewarding but everyone acknowledges how tough it is and how challenging it is but his advice is that you must show a genuine interest and you must ask yourself how do you demonstrate this interest in the law he says you can have all the shiny degrees and academics yeah. that you want, but really when you're pursuing a career in human rights, you need to have that little bit extra. And there's so many people and organisations out there who need help, mm-hmm. who need volunteers. So it's, yeah. you know, get to it and see what's out there. And I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the last person really that stood out for me as well, and again, just very, very practical People who work in very niche areas, how do they end up there? And it was Richard Port, MB. He's a solicitor who specialises in domestic abuse, and um, which is an area I'm interested in yeah. just from working with women's aid. But his advice was to get as much work experience in the general area, which was family law in his case, and really absorbing everything there is in yeah. that area before you kind of specialise into some kind of a niche area, which he explains how he kind of went into this out of pure, I suppose, pursuit of justice for people. And there wasn't a huge amount around in terms of experts in that particular area. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think when you're, when you get into work, sometimes you don't know exactly what you want to do. You know, speaking for myself, and sometimes you worry about what, what, what you're going to do in your career. But if you get into general work, you then Mm -hmm. can find it, you know, you you could be working for five years in general practice and one day a certain topic, a certain area comes across your desk and it just, you know, flags with you yeah. instantly. And then that's that's the path that you go down and you can use all of the information that you've gained throughout those five years in general practice and, and put it towards an area that you're very interested in. So yeah, I definitely think that's important. So. I think that's important. So just to sum all of that up for our listeners in terms of the advice, the practical advice, and you've given some really good advice mm. from your personal experience there, which you think is really valuable. But in terms of our guests, I think networking is probably one of the the top oh, yeah. areas, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I think working with you, even the first year and a half, two years of working with you, I spoke to more people than I had done in the, the you know previous 10 years and I think that's where you really really get to know know people yeah. and where you can you know 
extend your opportunities by speaking to people who are in different positions, but you never know when you're going to c- come across them again. And if you've networked before, whether it's on social media, whether it's on you know LinkedIn or whether it's at a panel or whatever, you know, h- having those connections is, is very important. And I find that that it's really, really benefited me. It really, really, yeah, it's really important. And it's something that people might find a little bit daunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think because of COVID and everything being so much more remote and online, you know, there's less, perhaps less opportunities, one might think. Yeah. But I think NGOs, for example, are, you know, really great for putting on events that you can go to for free or, you know, make a donation to the organisation. Mm-hmm. And even at those, you can not only learn from whatever topics being covered, but meet people that are interested in the same line of work as you. And you never know what yeah. can happen. No, That's never how know. You know, you can fall into, um, you know, great opportunities from networking events. The other thing is reading, 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 reading. I think that's really important. Well, I need to get back into reading. I haven't been reading that much. (laughs) I've been listening to books, but readings are completely different. Well, podcasts are a great way. Yeah, podcasts are great, but it's like even extending your vocabulary and stuff via Mm -hmm. reading. I need to get back into reading. Obviously, during university, that's all you're doing. Yeah. And then you got away from us, didn't want to look at a book again. But now, yeah, definitely want to get back into yeah. extend my knowledge through through reading so and i think when you're passionate about a particular area of law i mean it's brilliant to be able to focus on a full book about yeah. that area and yeah. get into um you know reading that complements you know your interest as well that's yeah. very often you bought me quite a few immigration books oh I yeah think, yeah that i read i didn't yeah. read them and um the odd time i'd get a present from i, I the the last book was sister-in-law as well for, from harriet Wistrick, which was um focusing on her work mm-hmm. um defending women um in the criminal justice system and her work as a feminist and an activist and a lawyer which was fascinating to me but Reading that really inspires you, and yeah. it's, my goodness, you know, yeah. um, people. And I even think this. like reading books. Not that you're not interested in, because you can't, you, you won't really concentrate on mm. something that you're not interested in. But on reading like topics that you don't particularly agree with, yeah, you know, like or even speaking to people that you don't particularly agree with a certain viewpoint that they have, mm. because I think the best way. To have knowledge about a topic is actually to be able to argue both sides of a topic, whether you agree with both sides or not, is to have knowledge of both sides. So say the wall's white and I believe that the wall's white, but you believe that the wall's black. Yeah. I should be able to argue the point that the wall's black as well. Right. And um, just to get a full understanding yes. of both sides, because, you know, just because you don't agree with someone doesn't mean that you can't respect their point and I think reading on some topics to have knowledge of both sides is, is important you? and you're curious <laughs> I'm just thinking we really miss Jack's lunchtime arguments <laughs> I wouldn't say <laughs> arguments no people say that I argue a lot no and that's why I got into law no I think do you that, think you just like to it's kind of like my husband if I say oh this person said this or whatever he'll see that person's perspective yeah. almost instantly yeah well, it kind of it bothers me well, quite Ma- a lot. yeah Megan always says I, that I don't like it she could have an argument with me about one thing and I would argue one point and you then see, later down the line I would argue mm. the complete opposite point. So while I agree in theory with what you're saying yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it comes from a good place it's yeah. also quite annoying yeah. just to let you know. Oh no it is. I, I, <laughs> I mean I get annoyed when people do it to me but yeah. yeah exactly yeah. I know you do. But anyway moving on to volunteering quite yes. an obvious one but I yeah. think it's very important and I think um, people will say you know you'll say volunteering in the next sessions doing what like what where and you can't really blame you know some people who have just qualified or have been really heavily focused on the books mm-hmm. and getting those exam results and getting all of those dissertations and whatever it else might be volunteering where what where do you go what do you look at I mean I think the first thing to do is there's networks on there that choose your area whether it's or if it's human rights in yeah. general and you don't really know what area you want to get into yeah i think the community at large is really open and really friendly well that's my experience yeah, yeah. anyway that you yeah. can pick up the phone and ring somebody oh, yeah. or email you know somebody who works in let's say whether it's the irish refugee council or pills that mm-hmm. we've had on the show twice and they'd be more than happy to direct you or many of these organizations will have a list of partners that they work with as well that you can go through and see if there's anything there and obviously there's active link and there's community ni i think it's community i can't remember community jobs Mm -hmm. ni that advertise volunteering roles as well linkedin fantastic linkedin i think it's absolutely fantastic yeah Yeah. so you'll see not just jobs there you'll see volunteer roles i think it's really important to try and participate in as much as that now it's easier said than done i know working for free very often but it's it's you do that on top of whatever 
whatever yeah. other work that you're doing. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Um, what I did was with the Refugee Council, I volunteered with them and I also worked with FLAC, the Free Legal Advice Centre. And I think as far as I know, you have to be a qualified solicitor or barrister, obviously, to give advice. But I think you can accompany solicitors and yeah. get some experience and um, seeing how they advise the public on whether it's immigration, employment, housing, welfare, whatever that might be. So it's really important to get yep. that experience under your belt. And <laughs> someone someone actually did ask me this recently about, well, I don't have any family members in law. OK, yeah. Well, I, I don't have any direct family members in law either. Mm. Um, and I think that is actually, uh, actually, I think Kieran Moynian was actually talking about that on his podcast as well, that he was the first person in his yeah. family to go into law. And I do get that because you're coming from basically ground zero there where you haven't got any connections you know, you haven't got any path, like set out pathway that say your brother or your mom or your dad had, had went through that you can use that as a guide. Mm. But I think if you're in university, there's a lot of, you know, societies that you can you can speak to yeah. people. And that's why I, I have many friends that I made in my course and I still had asked them for, for guidance and stuff because they they come from different parts of the community, you know, and they were come from different parts of Northern Ireland and you know, they, they, they can give a completely different perspective and, and give you one nugget of information that you can use to then go and oh, speak to this person, you can speak to this person. Yeah. And then it just it kind of just unfolds in, fr- in front of you. Yeah, but that is uh, quite a yeah. difficult... It is. It is. Well, yeah, I suppose a lot most, a lot of people I know wouldn't have had people connections within law. I don't know that many that might have. Mm-hmm. It does strike me that when I was in college, though, back in the day, um, a lot of colleagues did have relatives who were high up in organizations mm-hmm. for example within international law and they were able to get I don't know obviously they applied but you know they knew more let's say about how to get into yeah. internships or things like that that maybe you might not really have that kind of knowledge or experience but anyway yeah. you can find all of these things out oh, yeah. and um but yeah you're right about societies and college I think that's a big yeah. that's an obvious one isn't it yeah, yeah. that like um amnesty internet all of the those major organizations would have college societal yeah they're constantly coming into university they? and stuff and, mm. uh, and obviously when you're in university i felt that you know uh i'd rather go out for you know a drink in university than go Did to you? this well, no i went to some some <laughs> talks but you know pay, you know you need to just put yourself out there because when you're in when you're a student you it is daunting going to these random talks where you actually have to sit with random people and speak to random people but they, they are the most important. And I, I wish I had done it more in university. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's that's where you can find out important. important information. And not just at university, but when you start off, let's say you start in a practice or anything like mm-hmm. that, keep that up. Yeah. Keep going. I remember being, I used to sign up for anything and yeah. everything that was on in relation to migration or And now you can do it online. Ref- yeah, you can so do it So you don't even online. need to attend in exactly. Belfast or whatever. So you can literally just log on to Skype or mm-hmm. Zoom or whatever it is and listen to an yeah. hour or two hours. And just get that the, that information and extend your knowledge. So there's so much out there. Yeah. But yeah, so hopefully those little snippets of advice, oh yeah, um, plucked from our podcasts and from our own personal experience, yeah. Jack, will be useful to our listeners. So what does the future hold? Do you know? Well, you don't know, do you? No, no clue about <laughs> what, what I'm going to do. So uh, I used to be a person that needed to have everything planned out Good. in my head, yeah, but now don't. I'm kind of just going with the flow Take it easy um i think definitely traveling i would highly recommend you it. loved it yeah um before you know the thought when i was in university i thought it was just straight in straight into working and you know people who say oh you need to go travel i just kind of brush that to the side but if i had to give any advice it would be to go travel whether you're going to work somewhere or whether you're just going to go travel and see other places it definitely mm. opened my eyes to other opportunities um and whether i come back to northern ireland and work i I still don't know but it you know it's definitely given me food for thought now about where i want to live um but yeah no it definitely one piece of information would be to travel and and see speak to other people yeah Yeah. well listen i am delighted to have you thank you it's a fleeting visit but well you've been in the office for a few weeks yeah yeah uh, which has been great, and we're we're having, I suppose it's a joint leaving party <laughs> <laughs> today. Any yeah. excuse, any excuse in Yuri for um, a little get together in yeah. India and, and a few drinks, uh, but you might grace us with your presence again. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. 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 Thanks for joining us. Thank today. you so much. <laughs>
Thanks everyone for joining me today. If you like the show, please remember to share and leave a review if you have a moment. And you can also check out our website, www.activistlawyer.com, where you will see some blog articles written by our guests and contributors, as well as some fabulous Activist Lawyer merchandise. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast, but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.